Good morning, everyone. Please stand for the hymn. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. Let us pray. Almighty God, you sent your Holy Spirit to be the life and light of your church. Open our hearts to the riches of your grace that we may bring forth the fruit of the Spirit in love, joy, and peace. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who is alive and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated for the readings. The first reading is from the book of Genesis. Jacob lived in the land where his father had stayed, the land of Canaan. This is the account of Jacob's family line. Joseph, a young man of 17, was tending the flocks with his brothers, the sons of Bela and the sons of Zilpah, his father's wives, and he brought them their father a bad report about them. Now Israel loved Joseph more than any of his other sons because he had been born to him in his old age. 
and he made an ornate robe for him. When his brothers saw that their father loved him more than any of them, they hated him and could not speak a kind word to him. Now his brothers had gone to graze their father's flocks near Shechem, and Israel said to Joseph, as you know, your brothers are gazing the flocks near Shechem. Come, I am going to send you to them. Very well, he replied. So he said to him, Go and see if all is well with your brothers and with the flocks, and bring word back to me. Then he sent him off from the valley of Hebron. When Joseph arrived at Shechem, a man found him wandering around in the fields and asked him, What are you looking for? He replied, I'm looking for my brothers. Can you tell me where they are grazing their flocks? They have moved on from here, the man answered. I heard them say, let's go to Dothan. So Joseph went after his brothers and found them near Dothan. But they saw him in the distance, and before he reached them, they plotted to kill him. Here comes that dreamer, they said to each other. Come now, let's kill him and throw him into one of the, these cisterns and say that a ferocious animal devoured him. Then we'll see what comes of his dreams. When Reuben heard this, he tried to rescue him from their hands. Let's not take his life, he said. Don't shed any blood. Throw him into this cistern here in the wilderness, but don't lay a hand on him. Reuben said this to rescue him from them and take him back to his father. So when Joseph came to his brothers, they stripped him of his robe, the ornate robe he was wearing, and they took him and threw him into the cistern. The cistern was empty. There was no water in it. As they sat down to eat their meal, they looked up and saw a caravan of Ishmaelites coming from Gilead. Their camels were loaded with spices, balm, and myrrh, and they were on their way to take them down to Egypt. Judah said to his brothers, what will we gain if we kill our brother and cover up his blood? Come, let's sell him to the Ishmaelites and not lay our hands on him. After all, he is our brother, our own flesh and blood. His brothers agreed. So when the Midianite merchants came by, his brothers pulled Joseph up out of the cistern and sold him for 20 shekels of silver to the Ishmaelites, who took him to Egypt. The word of the Lord. I will listen to what the Lord is saying, for he is speaking peace to his faithful people and to those who turn their hearts to him. Love and faithfulness meet together, righteousness and peace kiss each other. The Lord will indeed give what is good, and our land will yield its harvest. The second reading is from the book of Romans. Moses writes this about the righteous, it is by the law. The person who does these things will live by them. But the righteous that is by faith says, do not say in your heart who will ascend into heaven, that is to bring Christ down, or who will descend into the deep, that is to bring Christ up from the dead. But what does it say? The word is near you. It is in your mouth and in your heart. That is the message concerning faith that we proclaim. If you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, 
you will be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified, and it is with your mouth that you profess your faith and are saved. As scripture says, anyone who believes in him will never be put to shame, for there is no difference between Jew and Gentile. The same Lord is Lord of all and richly blesses all those who call him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. How then can they call on the one they have not believed? And how can they believe in the one of whom they have not heard? And how can they preach without someone preaching to them? And how can anyone preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. The word of the Lord. Lord be with you. And also with you. The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Matthew. Glory to you, Lord Jesus Immediately, Jesus made the disciples get into the boat and go on ahead to the other side while he dismissed the crowds. And after he had dismissed the crowds, he went up the mountain by himself to pray. When evening came, he was there alone. But by this time, the boat, battered by the waves, was far from the land, for the wind was against them. And early in the morning, he came walking toward them on the sea. But when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were terrifying, saying, it's a ghost. And they cried out in fear. But immediately, Jesus spoke to them and said, take heart, it is I. Do not be afraid. Peter answered him, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. Jesus said, Come. So Peter got out of the boat and started walking on the water and came toward Jesus. But when he noticed the strong wind, he became frightened, and beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. Jesus immediately reached out his hand and caught him, saying to him, You of little faith, why did you doubt? When they got into the boat, the wind ceased, and those in the boat worshipped him, saying, Truly, you are the Son of God. The Gospel of Christ.
Please be seated. I'll introduce myself again. I'm Anne Moore. I live in Napanee, and I generally worship in Bath at St. John's Bath. I grew up in Napanee, and I have retired there. And I don't know that I'm loud enough. Thanks. We hear these words from Jesus' lips several times, so I'm going to read you some Bible verses. Jesus said, Come to me, all you that are weary and are carrying heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. To Andrew and Peter, come, follow me, and I will make you fish for people. To the apostles, come away to a deserted place and rest a while. Zacchaeus, hurry and come down, for I, uh, I must stay at your house today. Andrew, come and see where I'm staying. They came and saw where he was staying, remained with him that day. To a whole crowd in the temple, let anyone who is thirsty come to me, and let the one who believes in me drink. Lazarus, come out. The dead man came out to the disciples in Galilee after the resurrection. Come and have breakfast. Aren't they lovely words? And you know what? They're a command. He doesn't say, please come, or if you'd like to come. He says, come. Oops, got some obedience issues coming up pretty soon. Now, last week, I preached about the feeding of the 5,000. And at the end, they all ate and were satisfied. They kicked up, picked up the basketfuls. And then at the beginning of this passage that I read, immediately, Jesus makes the disciples get into the boat and set off while he dismissed the crowd. They didn't get there for the dismissal. They got dismissed early. And after that, he went up on the mountain. Now remember, they were by the shore, they were in the boat, they landed, he went to a solitary place, then all the crowds came, and now the crowds have left, and the disciples have left, and he goes up on a mountain. And it may have been a while, because evening comes, and he was alone, but the boat was already way out from shore. And it was being buffeted by the wind. A storm had come up, come up on the Galilee. It often happens. There's mountains all around, and the wind whistles around. And now it's morning during the fourth watch of the night, it says in my version, the NIV. Early in the morning, Jesus went out to them walking on the lake. I, I can't think how scary that must have been. But when you see a picture of Jesus walking on the water, the water's kind of calm. I have been on a boat on the ocean three times, I believe, and I wasn't well any of those three times. However, once I was swimming, I took swimming lessons in the Napanee River, if you can believe it, out further where it's wider, and it was always quite calm and I was a good swimmer. But the day of the test, I was about 10, and I had never seen waves like those waves. So it was fun when you're going up, but then all of a sudden you, you kind of go like this and there's no water there. And then all of a sudden you go head first into the water. And we had to go swim around. And when I turned back toward the dock, sometimes I could see the examiner and then I'd disappear under the waves. So that's my really only experience of waves. And this is Galilee where the, where the waves are huge. And they're, they're fishermen, they know about waves, they know about storms, but they're not doing well. And then if that wasn't bad enough, they see something walking toward them. Now, 
Think of the waves, though. He's not walking towards them. He's, he's perhaps disappearing and come, coming back again. Even more frightening. Maybe he's gone this time. Nope, he's back. Maybe he's gone this time. They cried out in fear, but Jesus immediately says to them, Take courage. It is I. Don't be afraid. <sighs> That's what I want to hear. That's what you want to hear. That's what we all want to hear. Peter does a strange thing. Peter's a fisherman, don't forget. Lord, if it's you, tell me to come to you on the water. Peter, are you nuts? This isn't the first thing I think of. Jesus and Peter were good friends. Peter trusted him, yes. I'm not there yet. I don't know whether you are. And in my version, just a little different. Jesus says, come, remember again, command. Peter got down out of the boat. We're not, you're either in the boat or you're out of the boat when the water's low. You can't be stranded on the side of the boat. You got a choice here, in, or out. And Peter, bless him, got out and walked on the water and came toward Jesus. I love that story. I love that story. But you have to watch these transitions, the buts. When Peter saw the wind, he was afraid and beginning to sink, cried out, Lord, save me. Again, immediately, Jesus reached out his hand and caught him. Now, we know that the disciples in the boat previously, Matthew 8, a furious storm came up on the lake and the waves swept over the boat and Jesus was asleep and Jesus gets up and says to the wind, be still. So they knew Jesus could still, still the waves but he doesn't do it this time. Instead of saying, be still, he reaches out to him, grabs his hand, caught him, it says. Do you want to be caught by Jesus by the hand? Absolutely. He says these words. Now, I want to do a little teaching here to those of you who, who read, read scripture, but read out loud particularly. Remember always that Jesus is perfect love. When you're reading scripture, it's easy to get a bit dramatic, especially as you get more comfortable with it. And you can get kind of dramatic with Jesus' words. Please don't. When you get dramatic with Jesus' words, remember that he is perfect love. Whatever it's, he says, even you brood of, of, of vipers, he's perfect love. How do you say his words with love? And it's hard, but it's important. Otherwise, we get a wrong idea of God, Jesus who is God. We grow up thinking God is some mean parent somehow, some mean teacher that we've had, and ready to lay down the rules. God is love. So Jesus' words, he says to Peter, and I can't do it properly, you of little faith, why did you doubt? You of little faith, why did you doubt? I'm sure he had a smile on his face when he said it. I'm sure he could have gone on to say, I love you, you can, you can trust me, you don't have to be afraid. But for the moment, think about that word, doubt. Doubt comes <clears throat> first. I can remember on the Alpha course, at one point, Nikki Gumbel used to talk about faith and feelings. And he said, think of 
three box cars, three boxes. And at the front, in the way you're going, is faith and belief. And you're in the middle. And the back end box are feelings, such as doubt, fear, that lead to unbelief. And you have a choose, <coughs> excuse me, a choice in the middle which one you're going to follow. Are you going to follow faith in God or are you going to follow your feelings? I have a friend, I said, I don't feel right about this or I, I, I don't feel something. She said, feelings don't mean anything. <laughs> okay. Feelings don't mean anything in the sense that we have to put our eyes on Jesus faithfully believing. And these feelings will fall into place. Jesus doesn't say to Peter, don't fear, or why are you fearful? He says, why did you doubt? Something about doubt is there first, and the doubt leads to the fear. So if he doubts that he can walk on water, <gasps> the fear happens. Other situations, we may doubt that God really cares for us. When we start down that road, that road, that leads to unbelief, a loss of faith. We're in the middle, we have a choice. It's a hard choice. Where are we in our lives in the matter of doubting. Doubt makes this appearance before we get fearful. Doubt's job is to prepare, prepare you to, to be fearful. So when I think to myself, why am I afraid? I, I've got this thing recently of being afraid to drive where there's a cliff or something. Why? I've been driving for how many years? 60, 55, I don't know. Why would I be afraid suddenly? I've driven in all kinds of different places, except the mountain. Well, I did drive in the mountains, but the fear had already started. <laughs> I was fearful. But am I doubting myself, my ability to drive? Am I doubting the car that it's going to do something out of my control? But I'm doubting something, and it's leading to this fear. And I'm praying, I'm praying, I'm praying, I'm praying. But am I believing the prayer, or am I believing the fear? I'm sure you all have something that you could be afraid of. He doesn't ask, why are you afraid? Why did you doubt? We, I read something just recently, I still don't know whether it's really true or not. He said, every single person, and I, when you hear superlatives like that, beware, but folks around you have a lot of things that they're going through. And fear often is a part of that. So our bodies are letting us down sometimes. Or we've had a diagnosis. Or we've been bereaved. Or our kids aren't doing what they ought to be doing. Or our grandkids. And we're afraid. We doubt them. We doubt whoever it is that we had trusted before. And there's the choice. Am I going to give in to that? Or am I going to believe and be faithful and know that God is all-powerful, all-knowing, all-loving, and follow him? We, we have that choice. Every little decision. I work, I volunteer a lot at we, Morning Star Mission in Napanee. You may have read about it probably in the newspaper, in the Anglican News. Uh, uh, it started in the Anglican Church, a Christian organization, mainly dealing, feeding those who are hungry, and we have a warming center for folks to come in overnight in the wintertime. And 
the folks that I'm with so much of the week have mega problems. Overwhelming to us sometimes. And yet, maybe just a few days ago, I sat down to a meal with a young woman who I have seen at her worst, and she was quite scary, angry, and she was in her right mind that day. And I guess that's why we continue to do it. And because it's a Christian organization, we are able to pray, and we ask if we can pray for folks, and, and they love it. They want to be prayed for. They want somehow to believe in a God who saves us, although many really can't understand that. But when we have someone make it, make it out of the poverty, make it out of the drugs or alcohol addictions, make it, it's a wonderful thing. Changing all those issues. We deal, yes, with the physical stuff, with food and clothing and, and shelter as much as we can, it's not much. And yet we're there for them. We partner with them. And whenever we have a chance, we, we try and turn them towards the source of all. Peter, why did you doubt? You know that I calmed the storm. You were in that boat that day. And something else about Peter. Do you remember right at the end of the Gospel of John, I hope I have it here, they were fishing and there was a, a man on shore saying, put your net down. And the disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, it's our Lord. As soon as Simon Peter heard him say, it's the Lord, he wrapped his outer garment around him for he had taken it off and jumped into the water. They were about 100 yards from shore or 200 cubics or 90 meters. Peter knew how to swim. And yet he was afraid. He saw the conditions. He saw the waves. It says he saw the wind. It's a little bit harder to see the wind. Began to sink. What, what will we do when the next issue comes up as it will? Will we be doubtful and skip right away to fear and fear leads to para paralysis sometimes fear leads us to wrong thinking sometimes or can we hear those words come 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 a command from Jesus to these disciples to all the individuals in scripture to us This passage may have been written or read today just specifically for you today. Who knew when they wrote the lectionary? Our God is so big. I, I ask you, place your trust in him. Obey him. Do not doubt. We have a God who loves us so much we can't even put it into our language, our, our, our enunciations, because God loves us that much and wants us and draws us. Just as he reached out to Peter, he didn't steal the storm, he reached out to him, and they had climbed back into the boat. And then, it was still again. There's one other point. There's a scripture reading I didn't know about. I can 
couldn't find it. Oh, and Job. We kind of skip over Job a little bit. Chapter 9. God alone stretches out the heavens. We expect that in Job, describing God. And treads on the waves of the sea. So here's Jesus treading on the waves of the sea. And the disciples would have known the scripture, all these descriptions of God that are in the Psalms and, and in other places. And what happened when they got back into the boat and the wind died down, then those in the boat worshiped him saying, truly you are the son of God. They already had it in their head that God can walk on the water, tread on the waves, and now they're seeing Jesus do it. Therefore, Jesus is God, the Son of God. Thanks be to God. God bless you. Let us confess the faith as we say, I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please choose to kneel or sit for the prayers. May God's Holy Spirit pray through us as we try to put into words the longings of our hearts for the church and for the world, saying, hear our prayer. Father, we thank you for all who have helped us to pray and to grasp something of your great love and power. We ask your blessing and empowering for all who teach and minister in your name, for Robert, Michael, and William. We ask for our Sunday worship to be an overflowing of our daily walk with you and an expression of our deepening love. Lord, in your mercy. Father, you, we thank you for the beauty and diversity of the created world we inhabit. We ask for the wisdom to tend it carefully, respecting the natural laws and sharing the resources, listening to all, whether they are weak or forceful, poor or affluent and powerful. Lord, in your mercy. Father, we thank you for the innocence of the very young and for the joy of friendship for all with whom we share our daily life and those we love but seldom meet. We ask for hearts that are skilled in listening so that we may discern and respond in a loving and encouraging way. Lord, in your mercy. Father, we pray for those in various kinds of needs, for those who are abused, addicted, homeless, hungry, in exile, in prison, for those who have no one to care for them. Raise up your servants to lead them to wholeness and forgiveness. Lord, in your mercy. Father, we thank you for the advances in medical knowledge and the hope of new treatments for many diseases. 
we pray for all in medical professions, and we pray for all who are enduring illness, frailty, or damage. Especially we pray for Ken, Neil, Helena, Jim, Derek, Anne, David, Judy, Gary, Mary, Pam, Haley, Sophia, Mike, Janet. And we ask that you bless all members of this church congregation, Nancy, Anna, Clara, William, John, Kathy, Joan, George. Give them comfort, healing, and peace. Lord, in your mercy. Father, we call to mind all those whose loved ones have died. Give them assurance of your presence and your love. Lord, in your mercy. Father, we thank you for your wisdom and truth, your understanding and generosity. We acknowledge our total dependence on you and praise you for providing us with all we need. We ask you to answer these prayers in a way that will be according to your plan and in a way that you will receive all the glory. For we pray in your Son's holy name. Amen. Dear friends in Christ, God is steadfast in love and infinite in mercy. He welcomes sinners and invites them to his table. Let us confess our sins confident in God's forgiveness. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy upon you pardon and deliver you from all your sins, confirm and strengthen you in all goodness, and keep you in eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Will you stand, please? The peace of the Lord be always with you.
Father, receive all we offer you this day and grant that in this Eucharist we may be enriched by the gifts of the Spirit. We ask this in the name of Jesus Christ the Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. We give you thanks and praise, Almighty God, through your beloved Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Redeemer. He is your living word through whom you have created all things. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he took flesh of the Virgin Mary and shared our human nature. He lived and died as one of us to reconcile us to you, the God and Father of all. In fulfillment of your will, he stretched out his hands in suffering to bring release to those who place their hope in you, and so he won for you a holy people. He chose to bear our griefs and sorrows and to give up his life on the cross that he might shatter the chains of evil and death and banish the darkness of sin and despair. By his resurrection, he brings us into the light of your presence. Now, with all creation, we raise our voices to proclaim the glory of your name. Holy and gracious God, accept our praise through your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, who on the night he was handed over to suffering and death, took bread and gave you thanks, saying, take and eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. In the same way, he took the cup saying, this is my blood which is shed for you. When you do this, you do it in memory of me. Remembering, therefore, his death and resurrection, we offer you this bread and this wine, giving thanks that you have made us worthy to stand in your presence and serve you. We ask you to send your Holy Spirit upon the offering of your holy church. Gather into one all who share in these sacred mysteries, filling them with the Holy Spirit and confirming their faith in the truth, that together we may praise you and give you glory through your servant, Jesus Christ. All glory and honor are yours, Father and Son, with the Holy Spirit in the Holy Church, now and forever. Amen. As our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to sing.
I am the bread of life, says the Lord, who, whoever comes to me will never be hungry, whoever believes in me will never thirst. The gifts of God for the people of God.
Eternal God, grant to your church the unity and peace that we have tasted in this Eucharist, the fruit of your life-giving spirit. We ask this in the name of Jesus Christ the Lord. Amen. Glory to God, whose power working in us can do infinitely more than we can ask or imagine. Glory to God from generation to generation, in the church and in Christ Jesus, forever and ever. Amen. The peace of God which passes all understanding. Keep your hearts and your minds and the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be upon you and remain with you always. Amen. Please be seated. Is it your birthday or anniversary this week? May I pray for you and your husband? Father, we give you thanks for a marriage. We ask your blessing on this young couple as they grow in faith and in following you and raising their children. We ask you to bless them in the name of Jesus. Amen. Announcements, announcements. So I was told that last week I was too quick in talking, so I wrote stuff out, so try to slow down. Um, so September 10th is our, uh, we are having a family service and picnic with activities afterwards. Um, we, and then the following week, it's to kick off our, our year with Sunday school and with children's, the children's uh, ministry. Uh, if you have children who you would like us to send an invitation to, we are mailing invitations to all of the kids. If there is a child that, I, that you would like me to email an invitation to the service and picnic or a family, please let me know. Um, we won't be here next week, but the following week I will have the invitations if, here if you want to write an address on there and I will stamp it and put it in the mail. But if you would like me to do that, please give me the name and address that you'd like it sent to. For Sunday school, we are looking for a couple of people. We need two people to supervise once time per month. I need somebody in the three to six year olds, and I need somebody in the six to 12 year olds. In the six to 12 year olds in particular, it will be helping to work on art projects of some sort which I will provide you. You just need to be with them. If you're interested, please let me know. I'm also looking for people for the older kids who might be willing to share some sort of skill. This would be a one-off, like one Sunday come down for to help teach the kids how to knit or to do some sort of special, like to do you know how to do calligraphy or if you know how to do drawing or something if you have a skill that you would like to share with our kids and the last thing is we are looking for we have to move our Sunday school room has to be split or Sunday school is being split into two rooms downstairs which means we are taking over the area when you just get down the steps with the little guys we're going to be moving a rug in there, but the floor is a little bit of a mess. So if you happen to have a small rug that you are looking to get rid of, if you are decluttering and you have any sort of, any sort of rugs, but a small, nice rug for our altar area, we would appreciate it. If you have any larger area rugs that you're looking to get rid of, we can make use of those as well. Um, also, while I'm on the subject of decluttering, we... Um, are looking for one small table, like an end table type of thing. If you have one and you're looking to get rid of it, please let me know. Thank you. Please stand if you're able.
Jesus calls us.